So, I want to talk today about how to install um, Kubernetes on Demon. Because um, not everyone wants to go into the cloud and, and wants to trust those um, cloud providers. Uh, many of the companies, they still want to have their Kubernetes and Plus in their own data center. And many people think it's very difficult to install um, Kubernetes on-prem. Like you have to install the operating system and all this kind of stuff. But actually, if you're using the right tool, it's only around 30 lines of code you really need. And I want just quickly show it what kind of lines you need, what kind of tools are used in the background, and then I want to um, demonstrate it. So, um, this one is not working. And this one's not Also not working. One. So that's um, the idea we're going to do today. Uh, I just want to go to the slides about, about 20 minutes. I think we don't do any questions during the slides because I really want to go quickly over them, give you an idea what I want to do. And later on I will use all those tools in the demonstration. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them during the demonstration because then I can show you the tool, I can show you the reconfiguration because in the slides sometimes I shorten the configuration just on, for the purpose of showing it so there's not, not all the information inside. So, but I wanted to give you a quick idea of what I'm doing, uh, what, what I want to do. So the demo is 30 minutes and after that we could have just a um, quick um, Q&A. Um, I personally work as a data center network engineer for the last 15 years at uh, Strato, which is a Berlin-based hosting company. So we own our own data center. We have one data center in Berlin, one data center in Karlsruhe. And therefore, I have, I have personally quite a bit of experience to work in a data center and what kind of technology, what kind of hardware we're using there. Um, the magic tool I want to um, uh, show today is Typhoon. Does anyone know Typhoon? Okay, no one, so it's great. Um, if you know um, Core as they have the commercial um, variants, that's um, Tektronic, but you have to pay for Tektronic, only 10 nodes are for free. Typhoon is actually um, free. It's their open source counterpart, it doesn't have all of the feature, but it's more or less very capable of installing Kubernetes cluster. So you're installing a small Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's almost uh, all the time very up to date. Um, you have a very short declarative configuration for Typhoon. So as I told you, it's only a few lines of, of code. Um, it's actually free. So um, it's free in the code and it's free for cost. So you just can use it and yeah, install your um, data center. So it's um, very practic uh, practical for just lab environments or for data center. I personally didn't try it in data center, so my scale is normally around a dozen of nodes. I'm not sure if it will really scale to a few hundred nodes, because as we later see, you have some sort of SSH loop to put config on the machines, but maybe there are some sort of limits how far it will scale. Um, and if you want to look at it, um, it's on GitHub and it's free. Um, right now they're delivering um, Kubernetes in the version 1.10.2, so it's absolutely recent, that's the latest release you can use. And so you don't have to use for core this extra amount of propagation flag because it's um, in beta in this version. You can install it as a single or multi-master, um, it depends on your needs. In my demonstration I just want to use the single master. Um, it's easier to um, get it up and running. Um, you can choose between um, two different um, network backends, between Calico and Flannel. I personally like Calico much more, so I, I chose it, but there's really no um, difference. I mean, you can, from the point of, of Quo, but you can use both of it. So, but I personally like the routed part in Calico much more. It's TLS enabled by default, and as well all the um, airbag rules are there, so you can also have it just to, to see how the TLS is working, um, just how the airbag is working, just play it around with you, um, so it's, it's really an awesome tool. Um, you can it, um, also direct not, not only um, against your private cloud in your data center, you can use it against um, AWS. Your private cloud, it's going against DigitalOcean and also Google Cloud. 
So you just have to learn this tool once and then use it against many different um, cloud providers. Um, right now there is support for um, two um, Linux distributions. Uh, surely it's in container Linux, the um, distribution from CoreOS because it's part of the CoreOS brand, so uh, certainly they uh, support um, container Linux. And um, CoreOS got acquired in January this year from Red Hat, so a few days ago they added also Fedora Atomic because they are now part of Red Hat and therefore they have to support the Red Hat distribution or the container Red Hat distribution as well. But that's um, the Fedora Atomic is still in beta. I personally didn't try it, so maybe it's working, maybe it's not, so I can't tell anything about that. So um, now I'm going to come to, to the configuration. Um, the lines you actually have to write. Um, there will be three slides um, containing the configuration. I had to put them apart for, for the visibility reason. The first one only describes actually your provisioning endpoint. You have your cluster, cluster name, you have your matchbox endpoint um, where the provisioning is actually done. So you configure matchbox via this tool. I will explain matchbox um, later on. Um, you describe um, or you, you choose which kind of container Linux channel uh, you want to use and which version. Cached install means I downloaded the core as beforehand in a local directory just to speed things up. And auto login TTYSO is very, very um, nice for debugging because then you don't have to type the password because on the serial console you are locked in automatically. So I would use that in production, but for, for deployment, test deployment, it's very handy. So that is just describing the basic idea of how the cluster looks like, what kind of endpoints you want to use. The next one will describe um, more um, points about your cluster. So you have the domain name, what's the cluster, what kind of name you want to use. So I just use an example.com domain, um, your SSH key, certainly this one is shortened, and you have the um, um, asset DIA. Um, in this directory, there will also actually one file so I split it up. The last one is um, you define your controller. In this one I have only one controller because I do single master. If you want to do multi-master, you would just uh, extend the list with more information at the second one. So it's about I shorten that and I only have in this um, um, slide one node, but in real deployment you will put in more nodes. You need the MAC address for the node because you want to do bare metal um, deployment, that means the uh, the server are pixie booting and you need the Mac to identify the machine, what kind of type it uh, is. Um, you're actually wondering how is it possible, possible to just use maybe 50 lines of code to configure a whole Kubernetes cluster. Um, the idea or the, the solution behind that is that um, Typhoon doesn't stand by itself. It uses a whole tool chain of tools to do the jobs. But all the tools are, are abstracted away from you. You can look into it, you can tweak them, but normally if you just want to use Typhoon, you don't have to use them. Uh, but I recommend everyone to look into them because you get more knowledge. Um, the first one we're using is Terraform. Um, Matthias mentioned it already, so you have um, your infrastructure as a code just describes, or you just describe Terraform um, manifests to describe your infrastructure. Um, Typhoon is using heavily, um, or is heavily based on Terraform. You're using ButeQ to um, generate all the Kubernetes configuration, the TLS certificates and everything um, Kubernetes uh, needs. You also um, generate the Butecube a self-hosted Kubernetes cluster. So we are going today to um, um, deploy a self-hosted Kubernetes cluster. That means the control plane of Kubernetes is actually a pod inside of Kubernetes. So you can do all the rolling upgrades which are really nicely done in Kubernetes with the own control plane. Therefore you have to boot uh, a female control plane and then switch into the self-hosted control plane. All the stuff is done by Typhoon. You don't have to do it by yourself. Um, as a basic operating system you're using container Linux. Um, container Linux for the configuration of it, we're using um, container Linux config. And the one which is actually con um, configuring the um, container Linux is um, a tool called Ignition. 
and the last one which you're using to get all the pixie boot and all the stuff out to the machine is a match box which we come on or which we will see later um, so terraform i don't think i have to explain it much more i mean it's, it's tool to design your um, your infrastructure in code and it has a many um, popular service provider like you can go to to packet host aws google cloud whatever so there is a whole list of um, provider and you're describing your um, application in code and the actual idea is that Typhoon is actually a Terraform module. So it uses all the resources Terraform gives. Can Typhoon use? It's just a Terraform module. Um, Butecube is used for um, a self hosted Kubernetes cluster. Um, so um, it's just generating the temporary um, control plane and all the necessary um, assets of that. So, like um, the um, MTLS assets and the um, actually um, manifests for the static or for the boot control plan, also the queue config. So it's just a tool generating um, config and the second one is um, configuring the ephemeral um, control plan with the actual control plan you want to use. Um, co um, container Linux is actually very often called CoreOS, but that's not right, CoreOS is the the, um, the brand, the company is CoreOS, and the distribution is called um, Container Linux, but very often it's called CoreOS, but actually that's not the name of it. Um, the interesting thing about CoreOS is it doesn't have any packet manager, so you can't up get install or yum install or whatever. Um, all applications are containers or systemd units. So, um, you install um, core as at the boot, it's immutable. If you want to change um, something at the configuration, you reinstall it. And therefore, it's very easy um, with um, Typhoon just to do the process over and over. And actually, Typhoon will do it for you. It will reinstall the machine for you. And as I told before, um, they got acquired by Red Hat in the beginning of the year. So if you don't want to support um, Red Hat and want to have an an alternative, you can use Flatcar Linux, which was forked a few weeks ago from the Kinfolk folks here in Berlin. Uh, their fork is, um, it's called Flatcar Linux, that's the car in the train with the containers, or in the train with the containers coming out, uh, out on, on top of it. And they um, approved of the core S, so they asked them, could we fork because we want to do commercial support, because right now Red Hat doesn't give you commercial support for core S or for container Linux. Here you could buy um, commercial support. So the idea is to configure um, container Linux is using the container Linux configuration or config, um, which is a very um, easy, very human readable YAML file which you can write down with a declarative idea what the machine should do, but actually the machine can't consume it. So you have to use another tool that validates your container Linux config and it will also transform it. And this step is mandatory, you have to do it. So and that's chosen on purpose because you don't want to debug and not putting a virtual machine in the cloud. You don't get any SSH login into it, so you can't look what kind of errors in the ignition lock. So there's always um, the tool between the container Linux and the ignition config to validate and transform the config. Um, with the config, um, you can configure user storage network. Uh, system D units, etcd, and Docker. So it's a very uh, easy format, and I think it's very easy to see and to use. For example, a user is defined like that. So I think I don't have to say anything about that. It's very easy to read, very easy to understand. If you ever written some YAML for whatever um, um, config management system, you will easily understand that. That's an example for example for storage. So you're mounting a disk. Format it with ButterFS, say that's the root label, and yeah, that's the idea behind. Then you can um, put a file on it. So I'm using the root file system, and 
um, the file system and um, write a file into it. So that's very a short example. Normally, you're putting in um, Kubernetes configurations, which are much, much longer. And you could also put in um, systemd unit files or drop in so whatever you would like. So that's the idea how you configure um, um, container Linux. Um, the whole configuration or the whole configuration specification is online. You can look it up if you want and see what you can do. The tool which you need to um, get from the um, container Linux configuration to the ignition with the config transpiler. So that's the tool which will translate it and also validate it. It's translate validate it and it looks more like this. So you have the container Linux config, you're using config transpiler, you're getting the ignition, ignition config. The ignition is running on the Kubernetes, uh, on the core OS or container Linux host during boot is pulling the ignition config and it's writing the system D files or whatever you configure to the, to the system. The system is booting up and then you have a configured um, Kubernetes node. Um, on the left hand side you see the um, container Linux config, on the right, side, uh, right hand side you see the um, ignition config and I think everyone would agree that we don't want to write that by hand. So, I mean, you could do it, that's not uh, the point that you can't do it, but um, I personally wouldn't like to have the syntax in Vim or whatever to edit with that. So that's always go to container Linux, go to the config transpiler, go to the ignition file. Um, the ignition is actually um, the tool, the daemon, the systemd unit is it, which um, only runs once at boot up, it runs very, very early in the root process. It runs when the init RomFS is started, before the root file system is mounted, before the pivot change from the init run, or init run FS to the actual operating system is done. So you can manipulate every disk, you can do everything, you can format them, you can repartition them, you can put LVM on top of that. So that was the biggest problem with cloud init because cloud init was running when the whole boot process was done and then you couldn't repartition the disk, for example. With um, Ignition, you can do that. You can build a RAID underneath whatever you want. It's, it's very powerful. So uh, before the user space, uh, and what Ignition is doing, it's um, pulling its configuration from a source of truth. In our case, it's pulling that from the Matchbox server. So it brings up to the Matchbox server. The Matchbox server is an HTTP and gRPC service. The gRPC we are using to configure it. So um, Typhoon, with the help of Terraform, is speaking gRPC to Matchbox to get all the configuration to the daemon. And the ignition client is just doing a curl to the HTTP endpoint and it's getting all the ignition files JSON based configuration to get the machine to the state where you want it. Um, Matchbox is um, easy to deploy, it's just a binary, you could start, uh, you just start with the Go binary or it's um, also um, delivered as a container, so just do, do, um, do um, Docker whatever, um, or Docker pull and start or um, Docker Compose. So for Matchbox has the idea about group groups which matches a machine to profiles based on labels. The labels are most likely MAC addresses because that's the most of the idea which uniquely identifies a server and data center. So um, you could but also use the UUID or stage level or the serial number of the main board or whatever you want, but I never saw that before. It's possible, but all the installation of Max, Matchbox, I saw they're using the MAC address because it's unique and it only changes if you change the network card. But normally you're booting from the onboard card, so this MAC address is not changing at all. So only if you replace the machine. Um, the other one is the profile which you have in Matchbox. Um, the profile says what kind of type this machine should become. So it um, sends the, uh, well, it has the idea that the template is um, pointing to the right ignition file for the purpose of the machine. So we have a nice picture of that. So um, we have different MAC addresses. We have um, the groups here. The groups are matched on the MAC addresses and the groups shows them then which kind of profiles the machine should become. So if they should become a, a Kubernetes master or worker or etc or whatever. So you have the idea of between um, groups and profiles. 
and a group file looks very easy. So it's the, the important part is here you have the MAC identifier, which identifies the node, and you have the profile, which profile is attached to, to that special node with that MAC address. And for that node, the profile looks like that. This, you're saying um, um, what kind of ignition file it should get, like the etcd YAML, and what kind of operating system, which version, and you're also saying the core as config URL is the URL for the ignition file. Here we're downloading the ignition file. You can put your um, variables inside the UUID and the MAC address, but the MAC address is most of the time used instead. Well, not the combination, but most of the time only the MAC address. So um, just a quick recap of the many tools, how they interact with each other. So the idea is we have the Typhoon module on the left side, bottom down, which is a module of Terraform. So you're just executing it, you're just starting it on your local machine. Terraform then is speaking the first step to boot cube. Boot cube is um, a binary on your local system. It's generating all the necessary assets, TLL, TLS certificates, and, 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 and kubeconf, whatever you need. And it's putting it in the secret in the asset directory. But then Terraform is um, doing an, a gRPC call to Matchbox. In this gRPC call, it's still container Linux config. Matchbox has an integrated container Linux um, transpiler, which translates the container Linux config to the ignition config. Um, then you can start your server, your um, bare metal server. The DNS mask, DHCP, DHCP and Pixie environment are left totally out of, of this talk because it's just MAC address and DNS name. They should match the MAC address and or the IP address and the name you have in the config, but that's, I mean, you, you can easy, or you easily could do that. The machine boots up, um, goes, it goes to the match box, it puts its um, um, ignition config, becomes some sort of type like um, master, worker, etc., so whatever. If the machine is booting up, you're copying via SCP the um, boot cube generated config to it, and after a few minutes, you have a whole running Kubernetes cluster. So, and this I want to demonstrate now. So, and hopefully, it will work. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, yes. I don't really know uh, the tool named Ignition, and from what you told, it seems like uh, the only purpose that it that it serves is like to take the, J the YAML file and then transcript it into JSON. Or no, that, the, actually the, the config transpiler, which is just translating and validating it. Uh, it's just the part of Ignition. No, Ignition is the actual the tool which is running on the um, container Linux um, system during the first ah, okay. yeah. And this one is putting the JSON file, and the JSON file is called Ignition config, and the tool is called Ignition. Okay. Yeah. And the, the, the translator or the compiler or this is called um, container Linux um, transpiler. So the, the names are really horrible and I used uh, I needed a few uh, minutes to, to get every, uh, all of this um, right because I, I don't like the names, I don't like how they call it, but I mean I, I can't choose it. So um, yeah, I don't like I, I, I personally think it's very complicated. So and um, therefore I want to, to tell you guys that you don't have to, to go through the same amount of effort to get everything straightened out, how the um, different tools interact with each other. And also how long does it normally take to totally reboot the core OS? So not the core OS but the container Linux. Um, it really depends on the hardware because I mean the, the most time a modern um, bare metal server spends is in the BIOS process. So in, in, initializing all the network card, RAID cards, or whatever. So the boot process is really fast. You will see um, the boot process takes on, on, on this example only a few seconds because I'm using virtual machines instead of real hardware. And I do Pixie boot them. So I, I do the same you would do with um, real hardware, but I don't use real hardware because of the point that um, every time you reboot a real server, it will spend minutes in, in, in its BIOS or post process thingy like um, initializing. Just for reference, like how big is the binary, like 300 megabytes it's or? 250, whatever. Okay. So it, it, it's really small. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do you, do you post uh, your presentation anywhere? Yes, I'm not sure where, but um, maybe just a link in the meetup and in speaker deck or whatever, but we will post it somewhere. Some mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And you probably Thanks. will find, I'm not sure if you're posting it in the meetup stuff or just a link to somewhere, but yeah. yeah. Okay. 
So actually, um, the whole demonstration is running um, on a virtualization machine, actually it's standing at my home, so I hope the DSL connection doesn't die. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm having here um, all the configuration you need. Um, the, we look into the provider first. The provider is just to um, get the certificates. That's the most important part because the GRPC connection to Matchbox, I use TLS to authenticate my clients, so that's just for the certificates. And for a real cloud provider, you would put in your password for AWS or whatever they use. And that's the whole cluster config I have. I mean, most of the parts we saw now, the SSH key is the real one. And I have a few more of, of nodes. I have um, five nodes in, in, in the cluster, so it's a little bit bigger, but not really a huge one. So what you're doing is you're starting Terraform with uh, the point of uh, uh, on apply. And you get what uh, you get an overview of what you want to do and just type yes and all the configuration we swear I'm speaking about they are uh, generated and uh, you're, you're ready to go. Um, I also um, start now the um, virtual machines. So I use KVM for that and those KVM machines they really do pixie boot. So they are empty, they don't have any, any um, operating system on, on them. I use two um, disk pair nodes, one for the operating system and one disk I use for four byte later on. So now you see um, the machines already are putting their, their um, stuff from, from the matchbox. So right now they're just putting their um, uh, um, image, like the um, um, uh, Inidrom FS and the first ma machines already booted the Inidrom FS and they're putting their um, ignition files. So it's, it's without the BIOS post stuff, they are really booting really, really um, quickly up. And we are now logged in via the serial console, uh, console on, on the um, first node. And what we're doing right now is actually we are installing, that's the most important part, we're installing CoreOS on SDA. So I'm not just pixie booting and, and just let, let the machines in, in the RAM FS um, and then using um, the machines. So I really um, boot them up with the RAM disk and from the RAM disk out, um, I um, install or the, um, we are installing um, CoreOS on the um, actual machine. That will take a few minutes, not a few minutes, a few moments I hope. Mm -hmm. and then the machine automatically reboots. And we will see hopefully that sh uh, shortly because I'm connected on the serial console so we will see the reboot. Any questions so far? On the other terminal you see that um, Typhoon is still trying to copy all the um, secrets, the assets to the machines because the machines are not initialized yet. Um, in the pre-boot process, there are uh, the people starting. In the pre-installing um, um, environment, we have an SSH daemon running, but it's running on um, 2222. So as an administrator, you can log into it, but Terraform doesn't know from this high SSH port, so it's waiting for the real boot, and there the SSH port is on the normal. Um, port number, and then we will see that the configuration is pushed out. Questions? Um, when uh, one of the machines restarts, on which services does it depend on? It probably has to pull the ignition config again, right? No, if the machine reboots, um, as I told, um, ignition is only running once at the first oh, install. Yeah. So if the machine just reboots, it will come just come up with the same configuration. Okay. So um, you're not depending on your matchbox server PC environment, maybe for the PIX or for the DHCP environment for the configuration. If you don't put the IP address into the ignition file, then you may be depending on the DHCP server in a reboot or a failure scenario. But you can easily put your IP address into the um, container Linux configuration and configure the, uh, the server statically. So you're not depending on anything. So just for the in install process. And as you can see, um, all the machines, they got all, oh, it's running away, 
so the SSH connection was successful, for example, here for node 2, and we push the configuration to um, the server. The next one is we should start, uh, we uh, want to start boot cubes, so that means now we are starting the uh, ephemeral control plane for Kubernetes and then want to switch to the persistent control plane of Kubernetes. started. I actually can't see it very well um, because the size is not so great. Actually that's one line and the one line means um, Bootcube wants to connect to the um, to the um, RP server which is not yet there. there. So the starting of Bootcube is um, we are downloading the boot cube container and then we are starting it and what boot cube actually did is to to generate those files that's the um, bootstrap registry and you have on the, on the controller on any node you have the kubelet so the kubelet normally gets its information what to do by the RP server, but we don't have an RP server yet. What you can do is just to put static manifest into this directory, Cube, uh, the kubelet will look into this directory and pick them up and just start the bootstrap um, control plan. So then you have a control plan, you have an, app, you, you have an app RP server, and then you can speak to the RP server to instantiate the persistent RP server. So then the real RP server you want to keep is just an object inside of Kubernetes and then you're deleting those files. And then you have a self-hosted Kubernetes cluster and can do rolling upgrades of all your pods inside of Kubernetes. So if you look now, we have already the post container, so they are still um, downloading And on the other, um, on the Typhoon um, script, we are still waiting for the boot cube process to finish, and it will finish when we instantiated the persistent control plane. So now we have a few more ports. The scheduler is already running, the RP server is already running. can see is that um, the well, it's, it's really hard to see in this size. Doesn't make it better. Um, the, the interesting part is um, like uh, at the point where the RP server we see here that the RP server wasn't there, then it got an error, and then the uh, if you will, a uh, bootstrapping control plan was ready and Bootcube injected all the Kubernetes object for the persistent control plan. That's also um, all those informations, which um, yeah, display not nicely on, on this um, thing here. And now you can see that it's watching the Kubernetes RP about the uh, cube scheduler. You can imagine the case here, the schedule is over there. So now we have to start the pods inside of Kubernetes. That will take a short time. And then actually the um, Kubernetes um, process is finished. So on the other hand, on, on the Typhoon module, we are still waiting for the boot cube to finish at all. I'm going to I can't show that that one.
that's still big enough So now the RP server is running and we're waiting for all those pods to come up. I actually broke up something. It won't work. It's one of the two things you still have to do manually. So I think it's difficult to start a cobalt right away. So but actually it's done, bootcube is ready. And the typhoon is stopped. So you can now export um, um, that's one of the um, parts which bootcube um, was written in the secret directory is your um, auth um, cube config. You get that and now you can go on to the Kubernetes RP and now you have uh, almost running a few things are finishing up but right now you have a running Kubernetes cluster and um, it was really easy to do. I mean we just started the script and waited for maybe, I don't know what it was, 10-15 minutes and now you have a running cluster and most of the time you wait for, for, for the point that pods are downloading from the internet. So if you have a local registry for all the pods, it will go much, much, much quicker. So now all the pods are running, so your Kubernetes cluster would be on all of them, a few still. Um, but that's the point um, to get Kubernetes um, started. Actually, I wanted to show them forward right now, but the point is I forgot a very crucial part before because it's still to you still have to do it automatically, and actually I um, forgot it. Um, because if you want to install um, Quobyte in the cluster, Quobyte is just pods inside of Kubernetes. So um, all the pods have to resolve the RP server of Quobyte. And that's not done in the normal um, in the normal um, configuration of Terraform because you or I had to, would have to change the, the secret and they have the manifest which are copied via SSH you would have to change the I think it's the control manager and you would have right should change this information to um, cluster first because that means um, that the um, Cube controller is not asking the host resolver to resolve RP or registry.cobalt or rb.cobalt. It's asking the internal um, 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 DNS resolver from Kubernetes, and we need that to um, resolve the service which are using in Cobalt. So I can start up Quobite, but all the pods wouldn't reach the RP server. So I'm not sure what to do. You want just to see the web interface. But we can't really get the pods up and running. I'm, I'm really sorry for that. Or we take a beer, I will redeploy it and in 15 minutes or maybe 10 minutes, the cluster is ready with the right configuration. And then I can quickly show the Quobite web interface with all its function on its crowd and it will just take 15 minutes to respin it with this right of the right configuration. So sorry for wasting your time on the first try, but that's live demo, I mean. <laughs> Yes, one question. Yeah, real quick. The, uh, just wanted to know, the Cobite the uh, software that you wanted to show us, what is it, it's, as I understood it, you would want to install it in order to run the Kubernetes cluster, or what, what are the, the advantages of just to get a Cobite? The idea is um, to yeah. use Cobite because Cobite is a software-defined storage system, so I want to use yeah. the spare disk I have yeah. to give them to Cobite, and Cobite is that we exporting those disks like an NFS file system to all my Kubernetes pods. So I have a shared file system from uh, in, in a 
people need to support, and they can move around in your data center. They can wander from one server to another server, and they take their volume with it. So if one machine dies, one physical server dies, you just respin or the Kubernetes is just respinning the pods for you on other machines, and they are getting their volume, the data for your MySQL server, whatever, automatically beneath it. So that's the idea behind that, that you don't have to worry about any incident in your, in your data center. And on the other hand, it's also if a, a, Kuba, um, it's a four byte data store node just dies for hardware reason, whatever, the machine just goes um, crazy, then four byte will re um, deploy or reschedule your um, data to other um, four byte machines or other pods in. in Worldwide is running, so your data integrity and replication level should be always met. And that the idea, because you, in, a, in our own data center, you can't um, or you don't have some sort of Google Persistent volume or whatever. Yeah, you can buy a big, huge NetApp, but at, at one point, I mean, it gives you in the third step, you get the same idea from a NetApp via NFS. But what is the point, or what will you do if one NetApp doesn't scale for you? So you're big, you need the next one, but then you have a partitioning. You have a few data on this NetApp and a few other data on the other one, but what would you do if um, you need the data on, on both of them? Or if uh, one NetApp doesn't, uh, or it's not, in, it's not able to scale the I.O. performance you really need. So uh, you can't really get the second one because you need one partition for your IOPS. So in Quobi, as we saw before, it just scales linearly to, to just put more work on it. So if, if you need to double the IOPS, just double your, your, your nodes and you will get double of the IOPS. If you want double of the, of the um, space, just put bigger disk inside of it. So you control in your own data centers. So um, therefore I think um, software defined network is much flexible, flexible and much more agile um, as big storage boxes. Because it's easier to get a big storage box to put it in there, but in the long run you don't know what kind of storage requirement you have in one year, two years, or four, five years. So with a net up, you have probably an investment period for um, 36 months uh, or longer, and maybe your requirements are changing, and you're much more flexible with software. Okay. So that's the idea behind that, and it's really a, a very nice solution to, to use it. Okay, securing the data and something like that. Okay. Any other question? Oh, I don't know, but will we also for you, uh, the, uh, um, so the data can be is decoupled or detached from the hardware? Is there, a, what kind of a backup system are you, are you contemplated, or is there like a physical backup? Uh, you know, where is the data kind of stored? And how about data centers use LTO tapes uh, to, to back up uh, the data? You know. That's a quite interesting story. Um, yeah. First, uh, you can actually choose. Oops. So, so the, the complete reliability comes out of the fact that we actually store data multiple times. For example, replication factor of three. Mm -hmm. So um, we make sure that there's stored on different racks, for example, so you can really power off one rack and they just be rebuilt somewhere else. Um, also, have erasure codes in there, you can have even yeah. high uh, For a backup story, it works like every other storage system. If you want to have a backup, just put it on some other system or do a replication yeah. onto another Cobalt system, so this is also working. Mm -hmm. So this particular yeah. thing is really it could be also in different data centers in different countries. Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Okay. So it depends if you would like to have yeah. um, multiple copies and multiple data centers which are always in sync. Yeah. There's the speed of light. Yeah. Issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So then everything else is asynchronous mm -hmm. replication. Mm -hmm. That's possible. seen here is uh, five or six more commands on the command line and then we would have a complete up and running cool by cluster. Yes. Um, I don't know if you want to wait or just go over for a year. <laughs> and the commands are very, very easy.
So what we would have done is actually creating the cobalt namespace because all the pods are uh, in a separate namespace just for the reason that it's more tidy, more easy to, to look over them. You would define a, a cobalt as well an initial bootstrap um, registry to start, but basically you have to execute a few commands like that and those and then for the client you have more to down on, on the site so it's really really everything is there so you have only to really follow this um, instruction if you have a running um, Kubernetes cluster you have to, to have a few prerequisites met like you have a second um, HD inside of the machine and, and, and a few run and CPU um, and resources while on the machine but the installation is uh, mostly very very simple and it got even easier with the operator um, Matthias and his colleagues um, um, developed in the last, I don't know, months, years, months or probably. Uh, so, um, and, and, and then you have this storage defined storage, with the, the software defined storage in your own data center and you can use the same ideas like the big cloud provider. So yeah, this solution costs money, but in my experience, it's worth to, to spend this money because the utilization of the hardware is with Cobalt much higher than with other um, open source projects like Ceph. So you never get good performance out of Ceph. Um, with Cobalt you have quite a bit of more performance. So they say oh, officially you're saying 10 times. I personally measure we don't have any official <laughs> but it's much 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 faster. So we already know the step, um, we are copying the secrets over and then it will just take uh, a few more minutes. So it's, it's easy that, that um, pods have some sort of cross effects to each other, maybe with the G-Visor it will become better. I didn't look into it too much, I just saw the announcement and, and read the blog. But I personally would think you could do it in a, in a corporate environment where you are the platform operation team and you have internal departments using the Kubernetes cluster in different namespaces and you have other rules on top of that. I think I, I probably think that would be okay to use it. But in a public environment, if you have really untrusted user on that, I wouldn't do that. But I wouldn't, it's not really depending on forward, I wouldn't do that in, in any, uh, with any software in Kubernetes because Kubernetes is um, right now not multi-tenant capable. So you have a very loose isolation of namespaces, but it's not what you have in OpenStack with different tenants. This idea is not there in Kubernetes right now. Well, how long did this take? I don't know, six <laughs> minutes. So we have a nice UI and everything would be fancy and you could see files being accessed. Um, I hope it will do this time. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about before to do some sort of um, little videos, videos about that. So a little screencast which I should could just play if something goes wrong. But I think where's the fun of doing it live? If you have some sort of videos in your backhand just to show it to the guys, yeah, it's working. I, I did it in the lab and everything is fine. And yeah, and, and later on, you were stuck in your own data center with the stuff and thinking, what's well, not working? What was this guy telling me? I have a question. Uh, you told that you've never tried this approach for clusters larger than maybe 10, 15 yes. nodes. I want to know what you do in real life for large clusters. You told that you work in a large data center yes. and you have multiple clients. Yes. How do they manage large clusters and do they have any workloads that are closer to like scientific research when you have multiple nodes that uh, communicate not only like to share data but also to share computations? Uh, are there any like uh, out of the box ready solutions for that? So actually, yes, I'm working on a big um, MISP, but we are not using Kubernetes in production today. So we are using Kubernetes in our data center for internal projects. So their projects are in the idea of a few dozen of nodes. So we have internal like um, 
um, bug tracking tool or whatever in those environments, but we don't do it as a customer project. So you can't rent in my company a Kubernetes cluster right now. So what we're doing is OpenStack right now, and OpenStack we are installing via um, Puppet and Pixiebo. So we just put a bare, very small image on the machines, and then the Puppet actually comes and it's configuring everything. So it's a whole different um, approach of configuration management or data center infrastructure management. And I also have a, like, not really a follow-up question, but a separate one. Um, there are many tools nowadays for those kinds of automations, but they all kind of seem separate and they have all different APIs. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there is at least one tool on the market that allows the app that is actually running on the device to somehow be a shared library or something like that, uh, pull information from uh, the environment and find out how many resources are available and do some kind of uh, not runtime type information, but runtime uh, resources, uh, I don't know, polling or metadata information. Is there anything like that or not? I don't know if I really got your question right. You're looking for a tool which is managing the data center, like um, the resources in the, in the data center, so you have a few thousand of server and you want to utilize, utilize them to, to, to a certain level, or you want that the machine is booting up and then do some sort of service discovery and it's getting it, its purpose, what, why is the server here, uh, you just have a plan. I'll it. rephrase, so what I mean is that nowadays the communication is kind of one directional, you have the, uh, Operator and you have the application that is running on the device. Yes. And operator says uh, how many, how much resources he wants to allocate for different tasks and different programs, different executables. Is there a way for executable or for the application for the binary to request from the environment that runs in how many nodes and uh, okay. I think many I, resources are available? I think I got it. I think what we want to do is if the binary can request more or less resources if needed. So the binary yeah, the it's kind of more communication. So that's um, in, in, in a very um, broad way that the auto scaling functionality, which you have in the public codes, and you have an auto scaling um, functionality in Kubernetes. So you mean if the uh, if the process occurs uh, overheating and there is too much load, it automatically expands the thread pool and allows more. What if the CPU is overheating? It's more like um, how many percentage of CPU utilization you have on the node. Yeah. If your pod is running above maybe 60%, that's your threshold, then a second pod is spawned. Then they both use maybe 30%. If they are rising to 60% as well, then a, a, a third one is spawned. If they are going beneath maybe 50, then one pod is reduced or, or deleted. So that kind of um, schedule you have already, it's, uh, I think you have that in OpenStack and in, in Kubernetes, the auto scaling functionality, but it's not like on, on a mere, more complex idea, like you have too many um, queries per second on the database and then you're spawning a next data a da a database in instance like that. It's more like a very rough metric and more of, most of the time I think they're using just CPU utilization. Okay, and another question is, Let's say you have a super large data center with probably 10,000 nodes and uh, it's not homogeneous, so you have different devices with different internal specs. Let's say you have uh, a rack with maybe PCIe and VME devices and then you have a rack with SSDs, like the normal standard drives. And uh, you have multiple different uh, binaries with all very different um, requirements from the hardware. Mm -hmm. And one way is to manually assign the tasks that are more memory intense or storage intense to those faster racks and some other devices to other tasks. Is there a way just uh, internally inside Kubernetes or OpenStack to make some kind of a formula that automatically maps the task to the device depending on its benchmarks or maybe internal specs? Um, I don't think there's a tool which does that automatically. What you can do as an application developer in your company is that you can mark your pods with labels or node affinities. So you could say this pod should use a storage class which is called fast. And okay. the storage class fast just has SODs inside. Then some sort of archival process would use the storage class backup and then you have large slow um, 
hard disk inside of this pool. So you could influence the idea okay, what kind okay. of resources are used. And also you could um, um, label Kubernetes nodes with different um, labels for CPU or GPU um, if they are there, or different network speed. And but the um, application developer has to mark their pods with the right label to get scheduled on those nodes. So it's no magic there. So it's, it's really you have to do it. But you can influence it. Okay. But it's not what you want or what you're looking for, like a magic tool. You're just putting the load inside, and there's some sort of tool which just um, observe the binary and then say, oh, this is the limit, or that is the limit, I will just will increase that. So that's um, not I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. What we do need. So I need my environment. So we're creating the namespace for it, and then we install in the namespace the four byte config and the operator. So you're waiting for a moment to get this pod up and running. So we don't want to see all the other namespaces. So the operator is, is, is running. The operator has um, custom resource definition, which we can use now to um, actually deploy what we want. So we have to use the service config. And the service. So what we are doing right now is we are starting the Kubernetes uh, the, the -like software in the Kubernetes cluster as a pod, and we're starting the web console, which is giving us the nice GUI later on. We're starting the registry with us, I would say, the brain of all of it, which is coordinated to that um, metadata server is doing some metadata stuff. And the um, interesting part or the part where we are actually storing the data are the um, two data pods, uh, we have them on the two nodes where we want or where we are going later on to um, deploy the client, client as well. So we have a hyper-converged node where the disk and the client are in the same box. So you could do it hyper-converged. So now it depends how quickly my connection is to get the pods downloaded. But it shouldn't take too long. While it's going on, can you also answer the following question? Mm -hmm. There is the web console uh, running. Uh, does it itself generate the HTML pages and push it to your device? Or there is some kind of uh, a special data format that it uses to push your data about the statistics? and how it runs internally? I think Matthias should answer this question. The web console is just a UI for like, completely the Yeah, yeah it just pages. runs on the host device that runs all the applications and Kubernetes. Oh, it's it's not just a single problem. This problem is actually the application, this web console server, which is talking to the registry over an API. Port. So there are many, many different microservices, and they are all talking to each other. OK. And we are just having to get the web console to configure everything. Thank you. Still downloading. Pardon, yeah, still downloading. But you can see the that's from the machine to the internet. So that's really, really bad ping times. So one more question, then it will probably be finished. <laughs> I'm not sure if I have any left. Short form question. 
So this deployment with Typhoon, can you use it for auto scaling? Let's say if you have a pool of three nodes, uh, can you can it uh, auto scale the cluster? For you mean no, so in, 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 in particularly for the four byte, if you have spare um, yeah. hardware with MHDs inside with M M M A. Yeah, if you this that you can just um, scale them. Yeah. As far as I know, right now, not the operator at itself could do that. But I think that's certainly a point where the operator could be improved in the future to just get devices by itself. So if you want to add uh, an additional node to your Kubernetes cluster, so you, do, uh, you are going to run uh, the uh, Typhoon uh, splits. Yes, you have to run a Typhoon script to get this one, and then you have to um, edit. You have to edit the service configuration, and has to put your new node in, inside of the target the service it should become. So if it should be a registry node, you put it just in this line or wherever it runs, and then you reapply this manifest to to Kubernetes, and then this node gets the right pod schedule in that. But that's no automatically that just like just you're putting just a new node inside of it, and um, magically Kubernetes knows what purpose this node should fulfill. So you can put the node inside. You um, configure it with Typhoon. You install Kubernetes as a worker node on top of them. Then you edit that file, apply it back to the cluster, and then um, the Crowbar operator is picking it up, and you can use it. So that's um, the um, web GUI. I don't want to go through all the stuff. Um, it's very manual. Um, you get quite a bit of information out of it if the cluster is up and running later on. But the important part right now is that we have the um, three nodes, the data and metadata server. You have to format those um, disks with the right. And that's data. So as soon as you did that, um, the main ten tasks are um, started. So um, the Quobyte pods are now formatting your spare um, hard disk in the server. And as soon as the formatting process finished, they are available to be consumed by Quobyte in your um, in the Quobyte application. Um, what we do in parallel is to install the clients and the client is the client config which just says like the service config which node should be the client and the actually um, pod description for that. So and in the meantime you see um, the nodes or the data nodes and metadata nodes are already there and then very short um, time, the um, node should be there and ready. So now the two clients already um, booted, so we have right now two clients. 
I just install the pots on them. So right now we have um, fully functional, is it fully functional? Yeah, a fully functional um, cool air insulation. So now you can start to consume the resources. Should I close that? Yeah, okay. So So what we need is to is to install the um, secrets that are just the base uh, 64 and code credentials that end up into the um, web console. Then we have to install the, uh, the second mistake I already or, or almost did. That's also one part which I don't like right now, but it's already um, changed in option, isn't it, you told me? So um, you have to enter the um, Quobit tenant ID into the storage class, because the storage class reference it. And right now you still have to go into the Quobit um, web GUI, get this ID, and put it in there. Um, actually, there should only be the name, my tenant, but that's not working right now, but it's um, fixed in the upstream stream release. One, ten, three, Kubernetes. So now we created the storage class, and what we now create is the persistent volume claim. So we're doing this volume claim, and um, as Matthias told before, Quobyte is a POSIX compatible um, file system, so we are doing the persistent volume claim as a read write many. So we could have different reader and writer to the file system. So different pods can read and write on the same volume. If you do that with block, your file system gets destroyed in second. But here you can do it. So, so right now the persistent volume claim is uh, pending and the persistent volume is also pending. So that's um, the persistent volume is there and the claim is also there, it's bound. So we created a claim in Quobite. If you're going back to the um, volumes, refreshing it, now we can see actually the volume and Quobite does know about the volume right now. So that's the volume we just created. We didn't create it in via the Quobyte RP, we created it via the Kubernetes RP, and Kubernetes was speaking to the Quobyte RP to generating this um, volume. And what we now want to do is to start a little application just to see how we could mount it. Um, down here we mount the, the volumes. Um, the application is just a busy box with a sleep command for one hour, so just to get a shell to, to go into it. And we start two of those. So the two servers are started. And now I want to um, log into one of those. And I take here the first one, the 86. Or both start with 86. Uh, it's a 24. Pardon? It's 24. Ah, it's 24, yeah. I was on the wrong part. Thank you. And I start. So I go to, to the directory, Quobyte, so we have mounted as nothing is inside of it right now. So what I want to do is to um, split the window. No, I have to increase that. and go into the other machine. The 
why is it not uh, C? So we have the two for the first one, that would be the PLN stuff here. So we go inside of that, we go in the same directory, and it's still empty because we didn't write anything. What we want to do is to do a, a watch one and look at the directory. So yeah, it's still empty, sure. Um, so now I do a touch on this one. And hopefully, if everything is working, the file is um, appearing on the other one. So I really mount this device or this file system on both machines. And if you look into into uh, that, you can see that the server, the host servers, are running on different nodes. So I truly have a shared file system behind the machine. So if you would do that with um, block storage, um, your file system will be corrupted in seconds. With Cobalt, you can mount it on many machines with Whitehill. So it's like NFS, but much more scalable. And that will close my presentation.